Welcome, welcome to friends, colleagues. Um, I think it's a wise spiritual practice to begin with gratitude, and so I have some quick thanks. I just want to, first of all, thank Harriet and Mark and Beit Shuva because it saved my life. And um, as exactly as Harriet said, I, I learned here that I could be all of me in a way that I never thought I could be. And I never thought I could be truly happy being all of me, and here I learned to reclaim the contentment of life as living as a human being, a whole human being, a rabbi and everything else that I am. Um, I want to acknowledge Stuart Matlins is here, who's the head of Jewish Lights. Um, <laughs> Jewish Lights may be the most important and popular publishing house of Jewish books in English around the world, and there have been so many significant contributions. I'm just so grateful that you and Jewish Lights have included recovery as a really important uh, part of the work that you do in bringing recovery to Jews who need it, because Jews are alcoholics and addicts too. Um, I want to also, um, I'm grateful that the residents who are here, I have the honor of being a spiritual counselor and teaching Torah to the residents, and every day they remind me who I am. And, um, and you really were the ones that permitted me to come out as a whole person, and I want to dedicate tonight to you. So thank you, residents. <clears throat> I have a lot of friends who are here. Um, thank you for being here. Cantor Herschel Fox is here, my cantor. Um, and, um, and my teachers are here, and I've been so blessed to have so many wonderful teachers. Uh, Reb Mimi Feigelson, I don't know where she went, is here, there she is. Um, thank you so much for your love and support, and of course my teacher, Rabbi Artson. And um, just a quick story about Rabbi Artson. First of all, this book never would have happened without Rabbi Artson. I wrote it and showed it to some people, and then I showed it to him. And I said, you know, I think I have a book here. And um, he was immediately supportive and sent it to Stuart and, and got the wheels turning. Um, but very quickly, this is the kind of rabbi and teacher Rabbi Artson is. I don't know if you remember this, but the day that I got told that I needed to go to rehab when I was intervened, I called Rabbi Artson. I had been talking to him about something else. And I called him. It was a Friday. I called him on his cell phone. He was in his car. <laughs> and I said, Rabbi Artson, uh, I'm an alcoholic and I have to go to rehab. And his answer, he paused, the very rabbinic pause, and he said, is this a joke? And then he went on to tell me that he would have my back no matter what. And that was a very liberating and relieving response and I really appreciate it. It carried me through a lot of tough days, so thank you. Um, this book began as an assignment at Beit Shuva. Um, when I was in the house, we had peer counseling, where we would talk to a chaver, a friend who had been in the house for some time. And one of the first assignments on the peer counseling was to write your story. I had to write my story and include my addiction, my alcoholism, my using, whatever. And as I was writing my story, I realized that something was off. It was just a, eh, something doesn't fit. And um, the piece that didn't fit was my Judaism. I didn't know how to write my Judaism into my story. And stories are a very interesting thing. I mean, we're told from a very young age about our story. Parents tell us our story. This is who you are. This is where you come from. Teachers tell us our story. This is what you're good at. This is who you are. This is what you can become. Society tells us our story. As Americans, as citizens, the media tells us our story. Tell all the stuff that we need in order to be happy. Commercials, consumerism. We're told all the time who we are in our story. And the truth is, is that we're all of those things and none of those things. And there's an, the ancient spiritual practice of reclaiming our story is really a profound exercise. And I think that's one of the reasons that we have it. And it's also one of the core principles of Alcoholics Anonymous. We go to meetings and what do we do? We tell our stories and we listen to other stories. And in the process of telling our stories, we hear our own stories and they're reflected back to us in a trusting community. And the more and more we tell our story, the more it becomes refined and clear 
as to who we are in the world. We have to be able to tell our story. And I couldn't really fit Judaism in. I didn't know how to do it. And especially, you know, being a rabbi, which is supposed to represent the epitome of what a Jew is supposed to be. I didn't know many Jews who were addicts or alcoholics, certainly not rabbis. Today, I know many more, but I didn't know then. Judaism represented something that was pure to me, something that was sacred, something that was aspirational, but I didn't feel pure. I certainly didn't feel pure when I was writing it. I didn't feel connected to it. I didn't feel worthy. And so this book then became a response to that question. How can I integrate my Judaism, which I thought was pure, into who I am, which is a little unclear, a little muddy, a little gray, a little bit of this and a little bit of that. And the key for me, frankly, what made it possible to integrate it was Alcoholics Anonymous, AA. Because AA is a program of recovery based upon spiritual principles. Well, Judaism is a program based upon spiritual principles. So instead of looking at the big book in AA as something that was different, that was not Jewish, I began to read it differently. I began to read it as a Jewish book. And I could begin to see the correlations. And so what began as my story then began my sort of dissertation on Jewish spirituality and how that plays into AA. Um, and that was a very freeing thing for me. Now, I had to go back. What was it to become a rabbi? Now, I always felt a little different in rabbinical school. I always felt like I didn't totally fit in, um, which I know a lot of people can relate to. I, I, I felt kind of like a fraud, like I'm not worthy, because I was told a story of what a rabbi was supposed to be. A rabbi is a symbolic exemplar. And I, you know, it was okay because there was a bunch of other people who I didn't think were necessarily smarter or better than me around me. But I did feel different. I felt like some of them knew more about what it meant to be Jewish than me. And so I kind of like found my own area to be different. I dressed maybe sometimes a little differently. Like I was the guy in rabbinical school who would show up in flip-flops and shorts or, you know, basketball shoes and shorts and a ratty t-shirt or I wore like ratty flannel shirts and I'd wear a baseball cap real pulled down like this or baseball cap backwards and not a lot of my friends and classmates did that. You know, they were dressing up the part. They had internships. Um, just a quick story about that which is sort of emblematic. One day I was sitting on the second floor of the rabbinical school and I was studying outside. It was like four or five o'clock and I was sitting there studying outside and one of my professors walked up to me <clears throat> as I was out there. My professor was Dr. Pinchas Giller, okay? And he is one of the most renowned scholars of Jewish mysticism. He's an Orthodox rabbi, taught in the conservative uh, rabbinical school, and uh, very knowledgeable, knows way more than I'll never ever know about Judaism. And what you have to know about Dr. Giller is that he also had a past as kind of like an alternative guy, kind of like a hippie, and that particular day, that particular day, he doesn't dress like this every day, that particular day he was, happened to be wearing, along with his kippah, a, great, a black Grateful Dead t-shirt, and black jeans, and black boots. And there I was in my ratty flannel shirt with my baseball cap turned backwards, I don't even think I had a kippah on underneath, and I'm talking to him in shorts and we're you know, shooting the breeze, and a rabbi, there was a chapel on the second floor where you know, sacred moments would happen, and a rabbi runs out of there, there's Rabbi Neil Weinberg, who was doing life cycle events. And he runs on and says, I'm doing a get. I'm doing a divorce, and I need witnesses for the get. And we're standing there. We look at each other. OK, and we go in there. And we're in the chapel, and it's, it's a Persian family. It's very formal. Everybody's dressed up, three pea suits. And we're like, oh my god. And Rabbi Weinberg begins to do whatever. I, was, I couldn't even pay attention. I was mortified. And at one point, he said he wants to read the get in Aramaic. And he says, Dr. Giller, you're the biggest scholar in the room. You should read the get out loud. And so Dr. Giller reads the get. And I can tell he's also feeling a little awkward in the moment. 
and we somehow manage to get through this moment, and we both sort of, it ends, we both sort of walk out the door together, shoulder to shoulder, looking down, didn't say anything, and he, we walk about 10 steps out, and he said, see, see what you learned today? You can never dress down. <laughs> sort of emblematic of what a rabbi is supposed to be, right? So I always felt different. I always felt a little bit like I was a fraud. And, um, you know, and that, and that insecurity, we know this is what insecurity and fear does. I projected it in resentment toward others. I became judgmental. I would sometimes look at other, my rabbinic student colleagues, and I would look at them in their past, which I didn't have. Many of them grew up in Jewish day schools, went to Hebrew school. They went to U.S. youth group. They went to Jewish camp. I didn't do all those things. And... I, I would judge them for it. I mean, I was like, and I would say to myself, it's a cookie cutter rabbi. It's a cookie cutter. He's gone through the movement. He's gone through all this, but I have a different kind of past. I wasn't exactly like that. I was different. And even though they might have had social access, they knew people, they knew Jewish institutions, they knew how things worked, I had one thing. I, I could outwork them. They might know more, but I could outwork them. I could outlearn them. I could read more. I could write more. I could perform better. And then one day we had a seminar, and a well-known rabbi, Rabbi David Wolpe from Sinai Temple, came to speak to rabbinic students. And the question was, what is a rabbi? And there's all sorts of different opinions about what a rabbi does. Does a rabbi make decisions about Jewish law? That was one opinion. Rabbi Wolpe said that a rabbi is a generalist. Generalist. We don't have to know be experts in any one particular thing. We just have to have a broad perspective of knowledge and be able to speak to most things, but not necessarily become expert. But in my insecurity and in my feeling of fraudulence, what I heard was, I have to be excellent at everything if I want to be legitimate. And so I felt like I had to be an excellent in scholarship, excellent in um, preaching and teaching and pastoring and spiritual counseling and in the camp setting and I worked really hard um, and it was kind of painful. The blessing was that I had an amazing rabbinical school education. I really felt like I had the best rabbinical school education. I learned a ton. I got a ton out of it. I saved everything. I taught everything I learned. Um, but it was a tough, tough going, and I was holding this inside. I really didn't feel like other people were sharing this experience. So then I went into the rabbinate, and I was hit with something I knew was going to happen, but I didn't know it. I knew that I was going to be the symbolic example. I wasn't going to be just another guy in a class with fellow students who were all going through something. I was now alone. I was the rabbi. My classmates weren't there. My rabbi wasn't there. My community wasn't there. And what I experienced in being the symbolic exemplar was an inherent feeling of loneliness. And I want to break that down in a couple of ways. The first thing in the loneliness was in my decision making. You make the decisions about policies. I was the principal of the Solomon Schechter School in the conservative movement. And so here's an example. Uh, I oversaw from preschool through eighth grade. In the preschool, one day, there was a, um, they were going to bring in a petting zoo to the preschool, as preschools do. And so the preschool director calls me on the phone and says, you know, we're bringing in this petting zoo, and the teachers are concerned because one of the animals that they're bringing in is a pig. Can you have a pig in a Jewish school for a petting zoo? So I remembered that Rabbi Artson taught me, he said, you won't know every answer to every question when you get out in the field, but you will know 90% of the question, answers to the questions. And I thought, well, maybe this isn't the 10%. I don't remember. I mean, I spent years studying Talmud and Kohs, and I worked my tail. I don't remember one Gemara about pigs and petting zoos. And so I, I called another rabbi in the community, somebody that I felt like I would could trust and wouldn't judge me for a stupid question. And I asked him, and he said, I don't know. <laughs> I was like, geez, this is a real conundrum. But he said, I'll tell you one thing. As a rabbi, you have to think about it like this. Every decision you make 
It's as if it becomes headlines in the Jewish journal. So if you're okay with the headlines, Rabbi Steinberg makes decision to have pig in the school, then go for it. If not, don't do it. <laughs> that was actually quite a big burden, and I felt very alone in this. Like, I could really, I could screw this up somehow. Um, as an aside, I did permit the pig to come in. Um, there's nothing against petting pigs. Pigs can be friends, too. Is that okay, Rabbi? <laughs> um, but it was an, it's an example of the kind of, I guess, what I felt was loneliness in sort of making decisions. Um, I didn't know how to navigate that. Now, this may not be everybody's experience, but it was mine. It's part of my story. The second thing about the loneliness is, is about personal observance. As Rabbi is symbolic exemplar, people look at how you practice your Judaism. There are laws and rituals to follow. And people want to know what you do. And so being a rabbi in a big synagogue and also in a big day school, like, I'm not known, but within like a two-mile radius of where my neighborhood and, the, and my institution, I'm kind of like a celebrity. So like wherever I go, there's somebody there. So back in the days when Blockbuster existed, you know, I would go to Blockbuster. And inevitably, every time I would see somebody that I knew. And I had to think about this. Well, like, can I rent that movie? Like, how does that look if I rent this movie? You know, what are they going to think? The rabbi's watching this. And if you ask my wife, she'll tell you that I am a sucker for, like, the, all the B action movies. If it has Jason Statham in it kicking ass, I will watch it multiple times. And, like, I had to think about that. Like, should I, what kind of movies can I, if I go to the supermarket and I roll up with something in my cart, are people going to question, oh, he's eating something that doesn't have a heck sure. You know, and then you have to explain it and... And, um, you know, one of my friends, David Glickman, who was a rabbi about my age, also in Dallas, said, you know, now I'm a conservative rabbi, and conservative rabbis care about Jewish observance quite a bit. We follow halakha, Jewish law. And he said, this, this thing about conservative rabbis is that we have in common something that no other rabbis have in common with Chabad, the ultra-Orthodox Chabad. We are way more observant than the congregations and communities we serve. The problem is we don't look like it. And so people don't totally get it. So they ask you, I was asked questions like, do you keep Shabbat? Do I, I'm a, do I keep Shabbat? What kind of question is that? And what they mean if you continue to the conversation is, do you use electricity on Shabbat? And so here as a conservative rabbi, because everything has to be so complicated and gray, you get into this conversation and you're watching yourself, and you find yourself sounding like you're like a philosopher from another solar system, that you have no idea how the world works. And so you, have, you end up asking this, this question back, and you say, well, what is electricity exactly? <laughs> and the person just wants to know, but you feel like you have to explain and teach all ends of this. Do you drive? Well, what is it that makes up driving on Shabbat? What is the symbolic representation? And you end up with these conversations that are very convoluted, and it feels like you're alone. You're having a conversation, and you're involved in some intellectual discussion that nobody knows what in, else is involved in that. The third thing is, can you have friends as a rabbi? You know, Harriet talked about this a little bit. Can, can you really have friends with your congregants? You know, I guess you can have friends with your rabbinical school classmates. How, what can you really reveal about yourself? If you reveal your imperfections or your struggles, even with Judaism, you could be judged. You could lose your credibility. At least that's what I thought. And, and then people don't want to reveal things to you. They clean up for the rabbi when you come over. They dress up for you. They don't want you to know how they don't keep Shabbat or how they don't eat kosher. And they end up explaining, justifying their behavior a lot of times doing this. And it, there's an awkwardness. I know Rabbi Artson talks a lot about how we have to keep our friends from when we were before rabbis, but some, you know, you get worked up, and I personally lost a lot of contact with some of those people. And I was in Dallas when I started, and Dallas is in the middle of nowhere. Dallas is an hour from Oklahoma. Okay? That's where Dallas is. It's in the center of the country. There's nothing close to Dallas. And so I couldn't really communicate with friends and family a lot of times about the stuff I was going with. And the last thing, and I'll wrap up, is that 
and I'm really concerned about this, is can a rabbi be friends with the colleagues? And right now, there's a major movement to, for rabbis to be more business-oriented, administrative. Rabbi as CEO. So you have these colleagues, you have people who work for you, but can you really reveal and be yourself and, and, and your authority? What I was taught is your authority as a rabbi is Torah. That's all you have. You're not a politician. You're not a scientist. Your authority is Torah, but spirituality. But can you really be like that with somebody when you're the one who's making decisions about their salary? When you're the one negotiating contracts? When you're the one firing people? And I fired quite a few people. And it was very painful. I didn't always know how to navigate that as a rabbi. And so what ended up happening with all of these things is that my shame and my fraudulence caught up with me. And I found myself living a very divided life. I found myself on one hand playing a part and teaching things that I myself was unable to internalize. I knew it, but I had a really hard time living it. I didn't know how to combine my soul and my role. I mean, I knew it up here, but I was caught in a cycle of shame and isolation and loneliness. And, um, and when I came to Beit Shuva, and this is why I mentioned the residents, you know, I could be something else. I could be rabbi, I could wax rabbinic, but I could also make a dirty joke. I could also say something silly. I could show my imperfections. Thank you. Um, and my soul and role slowly began to grow and emerge, and now I can talk like this openly, where I don't know that I could have talked like this a year ago. I might have wanted to perform um, and make it perfect. And so I'll just end with this. In, um, it, it, what I fear, I think what most of us fear, is to live in total isolation. To be dead while everyone else around you is alive. To not be able to connect. And that's what it was like for me. That's how I felt. I was surrounded by people, but utterly alone. And when I'm in that place, the initial human response, in that yearning to connect, what I, I, that's what I call prayer. It's a reaching out. It's an intention to connect and be fully me. And today, my life is prayer. My life is a prayer. It's all day, every day. And it tends to going back to my core, who I am, all of who I am, and reaching out to connect in others with others in love. So thank you for being here and listening to my story and sharing my story in my life. And um, it's now my honor to uh, welcome up my teacher and Rabbi Rabbi Artson, for, who trains rabbinic students to come up and share a few words. <laughs>